Merry Christmas for all of British Columbia, not just FIR and the IWA, but a pat on the back, substantial pat on the back to all those who played a part in settling this disastrous strike. First, here's Steve with tonight's rundown. It's called a scrum, where one politician is the target for an army of microphones in a crowded hallway. News gathering or manipulation. The Scrum is one target in a new book, The Newsmongers, and one of its co-authors, Marianne Comer, is coming up with Webster. Corporate giants are taking their business and moving out of South Africa, but apartheid persists under the Bota regime. Are sanctions doing anything positive for the black majority, or is more violence inevitable? Tonight, Dr. Magosutu Butelezi, Chief Minister for the Homeland of the KwaZulus. But first, 20 weeks later, there is finally a break in the bitter strike in the lumber industry. The IWA and Forest Industrial Relations have agreed on a two-year deal. In the studio now with Webster, Jack Monroe, president of the IWA. Until 3 o'clock this afternoon, it seemed almost inevitable that the IWA-FIR dispute would go on forever and a day. And then came the announcement. So I asked Jack Monroe of the IWA, the regional director, to come out here and spell out the details of this agreement. And first of all, ask him, has your executive decided to recommend this? Yes, we have, Jack, and uh, it's a unanimous recommendation, which is, uh, is, is most welcome. Uh, we're happy with it. It has established uh, something that it's unfortunate. It, it took us long to establish, but we have full protection from losing our jobs against contractors, full pension, early retirement, Let's get that from the beginning. First of all, do you have to have a vote of the membership? <clears throat> so can you say to, from the executive, get back to work on Monday? No, we, we're, uh, we've got everything uh, full gear, uh, full speed ahead, Jack. Uh, we're going to start voting tomorrow morning. Uh, we will be able to complete it by uh, Monday night. So there should be some people back to work, uh, graveyard shift Monday or Tuesday morning, Monday night. Uh, could Hopefully you, the industry start up uh, by Tuesday. Spell out for me first the details, the main details of the tentative settlement. Jack, the, uh, the, the, the pension plan is, uh, is as per our demand, basically. It's, it's early retirement at age 55 with, uh, with an easy reduction, an 18% discount. In other words, prior to this, it was pensions at 65. Right. You negotiated earlier, right. and now confirmed down to 60, with a full pension at 60. Full, full pension at age 60. That's $25 right. per month per year of service. $25 per month per year of service. And in this tentative agreement, they have the pensions now will be payable at 55 with, with an 18% discount. Right. The well, employer, that, employer pays a contribution. The contribution rates go to $1.25 per hour. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it, it's, we're really quite pleased with the pension, Jack. It's, it's a first for, for a lot of industries. It allows our people to get out a bit earlier and, and still be able to en enjoy. Uh, Supposing uh, I have been laid off and I've been out of the industry for some little time, will I still qualify for the pension? Yes, you will, Jack. And, and part of this provision goes back to try and get us over some of the, the, the tough times that we've had. It's retroactive, I think, to, to uh, July 1, 1983. Uh, there's there's some easy provisions in it, so it, it's it's good. It's, it's so really that long-time employees can qualify for the yes. pension at 55 if there is no job for them now in the industry. Yes. Now, that's really a side issue, but it must expect a, 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 it must affect a lot of workers. Oh, it does, Jack, and and we've still got the odd plant around that uh, that, that may not survive, uh, you know, and and if 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 it's uh, if there are some plants that uh, that are going to be shut down, this this really is a major advantage to, to those people. Really, really good news. Right. Let's go to the other terms of the tentative agreement dealing with the flexibility, contracting out, guarantees of work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, <clears throat> funerals shouldn't be very happy things, but we are very pleased that we have completely and totally buried the Hodgson report. There is not one word of it in this agreement. It's gone. It's it's forever. Hopefully, nobody will have to read it again. There is nothing in this settlement out of the Hodgson report. It's gone. The, the, uh, the, the back to work, uh, as far as contracting and, and that is concerned, that's referred to a Royal Commission consultation for the, uh, for the three member commission. Uh, we should get at that uh, very quickly. The commission will report uh, March the 1st, 1988. So it's a two year agreement. Uh, 
The, uh, in the meantime, uh, the, the, the membership uh, are protected and their jobs are protected, their position is protected. If a person retires, an IWA person goes in and fills that job, uh, you know, a vacancy is going to be filled by IWA people and, and it is, we're pleased with it. Therefore, there will be no extension of contracting out in logging beyond what is presently being done and acceptable to union. Or manufacturing, Jack. Or manufacturing. It's froze. Frozen. It's, it's both freeze. of them. Yes. You're telling me that both logging practices and contracting out and the sawmills and manufacturing plants separately are frozen as to your job positions yep. within the agreement. Yes, yes. But there will and still if be... A millwright, the if a millwright retires, Jack, that we talked about, or a welder, I think, when I was on your show last, or a logging truck driver, if that person retires, moves, if there's a vacancy, it has to be filled by an IWA person. And this has been agreed to by yes. the FIR? Yes. Just by the way... And the Southern Interior Association, and Northwood, and Canfor in the Northern Interior, and uh, West Fraser. Now, uh, logging, logging practices stay the same as they're yes. presently in the contract? Yes. we don't have to work seven days, and we don't have to work ten hours a day, and we don't have to do all of that other nonsense. Except, of course, in some cases you have worked longer hours and longer shifts by local agreement, well, and that kind of thing will continue. In isolation, yeah, that, right, wherever. Yeah. All right, yeah. now what about the straight time production in mills on Saturday to correct what the Hudson suggested that, that was is, imbalances in production? Jack, the flexibility is referred to the Commission. Uh, everything stays as is at the present time. That, that's out of the Hudson Commission, and, uh, and it's gone. Okay, now what about uh, the... Um, the $200 signing bonus, That's what Jack, I was looking for. It was an insult to our, our integrity. It was an insult to, to, uh, to whatever. Why, in heaven's name, Don't we've never mentioned anything about a signing bonus. Somebody throws us... $200 signing bonus. We do not have a signing bonus. You don't need to go back over bad feeling. The right. $200 yes, bonus is that. I'm supposed to feel good today. Yes, yes I feel you... good today. Right. right. The now, signing bonus is not there. It's gone. What about the wage increase in the second year of the contract? 40 cents. 40 cents. So it's 40 cents in the second year of the contract. Complete freeze on positions. Yes. Although you normal technological changes would be allowed, etc., uh, etc. Sure. Et yes. Yeah. But we, we won't lose any more jobs to, to contractors or subcontractors, Jack, and, and, and that's the good thing. The Commission gives us time to do a proper, both sides, to do a proper uh, job of, of uh, laying it out uh, the way it is. We, uh, we're happy with that. The initiative, Jack, started from, from the truck loggers at a meeting that, uh, that uh, myself and a few members off the committee uh, had with the truck loggers last Monday night. Uh, they deserve um, a pat on the back uh, for uh, for getting uh, this initiative going. And, and thank goodness it it was uh, it, it worked. It, it was uh, it's, it's different than what they proposed, but it got us going. It got us back to the bargaining table. And of course, you're pleasantly pleased with the uh, approval of the deal by Forest Industrial Relations. Oh yeah. You got the agreement, a new two-year tentative agreement. With, okay. what, with much of what you're looking for, especially the pensions at 55, even with an 18 uh, percent discount. Yep. What are you going to tell your members to do in the vote between now and Monday night? Uh, we're, we're, Jack, we're really happy. The, uh, the committee is, uh, is unanimously recommending uh, ex acceptance of the vote. Uh, uh, listen to your local radio or, uh, or, or phone the local offices. The, the meetings are being arranged very quickly. Uh, we should be finished. Uh, a meeting by Monday uh, afternoon. Uh, It'll be tabulated. Vice no. votes. No, secret ballots, Jack. Secret ballot yes. votes. So you're all set to go back to work. <clears throat> Hopefully. Anything Hopefully else forgotten we would, about? Well, no. We would ask the employers to uh, to take it easy on some of the deductions, you know, and let uh, let as much money stay on the paycheck uh, as possible until uh, you know until after Christmas. Uh, we have to pay back our health and welfare and insurance premiums and that. Uh, I would hope that the employers will let that go till after Christmas. And then you'll be raising a levy later on to pay off some of the nine and a half million dollars you borrowed for the strike fund. That, um, that vote uh, carried well, very well, Jack, close to 80 percent, actually. That was the levy vote? Yes. We'll leave that for another time. My congratulations, if I dare, to you and to Mr. Keith Bennett and the, of the FIR and the truck loggers and Graham Leslie and all of you for... All our members in the interior. All your members everywhere for really, preventing... Really quite like watching you for some unknown reason. For preventing a further <laughs> disastrous extension of the strike. 
Thank My you. thanks to Jack Monroe. No thanks, phone sir. calls tonight. <laughs> Just wanted him to tell you directly that it's okay to vote yes for this recommended agreement. Yes, vote yes this time, yes. My thanks to Jack Monroe. <laughs> now I'll get down to serious international politics after the break. Everyone in this country, or almost everyone, is his own expert on South African politics and troubles. And everyone is well aware of the international confrontation on apartheid and on sanctions against South Africa. And we all know the names Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and Prime Minister Botta. And there's another name we don't see often in this continent. And that's the Honorable Dr. M.G. Butelezi who is the chief minister of the KwaZulu homeland and the chief of the Zulus. How many people are in your homeland? Or how many Zulus are there? The Zulus are 7 million, which is the largest single ethnic group, black or white, in South Africa. Now, are they in one homeland, or are they no. spread throughout South Africa? Uh, uh, half are in what is Guaz in KwaZulu, and half are in Soweto and other parts of South Africa. Now, you, sir, do not have the, the black viewpoint we hear about all the time. In fact, I am told, and you will forgive me, that you act as a puppet of the Bota government. Of course, there's a lot of tribe by my political detractors. And of course, people consume it as if it's fact. But it's no more than detractors, you know, nonsense, really. Well, what, who is Butelezi and what does he campaign for? Are you in favor of apartheid? In fact, uh, I'm known throughout the world as an opponent of apartheid, which is the reason why heads of states in Africa and heads of states in the West have received me, you know, with the credentials I have as an opponent of apartheid. That's why Dr. Nelson Mandela, who is the martyr of Black Africa, has continued to, to be warm towards me, has written letters to me from jail, has sent messages to me from jail. Mandela is a friend of yours. He's my brother in the struggle, and he regards me as such. Now, again, from the simplistic Canadian viewpoint, should there be one man, one vote now in South Africa? Yes, in fact, I am committed to one person, one vote in South Africa. But in fact, uh, with the Guazulu Natal thing, they came out once with the one person, one vote diluted with a minority veto. That was in, about in the early 80s. And I was prepared to endorse that only in the spirit of Mao Tse Tung saying that even a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Now, they have come out now in a few weeks ago with another blueprint, that is, those who are sitting in what is called Indawa. And they've come out now with a bicameral uh, uh, legislature with about 100 people elected on the basis of one person, one vote across the race, all race groups, and a second chamber where people will look up the interests of each cultural group. You've lost me. What's an Indaba? Indaba is a Zulu word for conference, and now since April this year, People of all race groups and all political organizations are invited, even ANC and, and UDF and also Mr. Boyer's ruling party. But of course, ANC and UDF did not participate, uh, but Mr. Boyer sent what he called observers. They have been looking, they have produced a Bill of Rights, which is in front of you. Uh, as the first thing. You mean Bota has produced No, this? no, no. The, your endeavor. My endeavor has produced Your conference it. of Zulus. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's people of all race groups in the region that you see here. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, the white region is white because there are white Indians and colors there, and the black section is supposed to be Guazulu. But because of my rejection of apartheid and homelands policy, from 1980 I appointed a commission to, to look at whether we cannot merge this place as one state within the, perhaps a federal state of South Africa. You're talking about a state, a separate state, called the Natal option, containing whites and blacks, yeah, correct. which in, would be independent. No, no, no. Which, within the context of Africa, in a federal sort of formula. In know. a federal formula. Mm. OK, perhaps I could understand that. But what about the fact that my mind is filled with stories of oppression, brutality, police power, abominable housing, the denial of rights for black Africans? Does all this exist in South well, Africa? Well, th that, of course, exists. That is a fact, you know, that apartheid, you know, still exists in my country. Although Mr. Porter has said that uh, it is anti antiquated and that uh, it is um, outmoded, as he said in Parliament, but we still wait for him to translate it into action. 
uh, he has removed a few things like past laws and so on and has allowed blacks to participate in the trade union movement, which I think myself is quite a, a fundamental change. But otherwise, the, the important question of uh, of power sharing at the center of power is the question that he has not addressed. He has not addressed. He has not addressed that. Yes. Now, your official position is uh, the leader of the chief minister of the KwaZulu Home. I'm elected as chief minister of KwaZulu. Yes. And you're elected by Zulus. Uh, precisely. By I mean, all black yes, Zulus. By all Zulus. And also, I'm president of Inkata, which is, is a membership of 1.3 million. It's a political organization which I founded in 1975. And it's not a Zulu organization. It has, it has blacks even from other ethnic groups. Now, you, uh, do you support the sanctions on South Africa as a way of pressuring Bota to move quicker towards one man, one vote? So I would say that the black people, uh, by and large, don't support sanctions. Because whereas if sanctions were sharp and short, I th I'm sure that the people who support them, I would support them. There are, of course, as you know, Mr. Webster, voices that do support sanctions, black voices. But by and large, black people in their millions don't support sanctions. And surveys done by the Sunday Times of London and also recently a survey revealed on the 1st of December have shown that the majority of blacks do not support sanctions. Can you say that to me? Can I really believe when I listen to all the African National Conference pledges to overthrow the government by violence? Would you suggest the African National Conference is not, a, a re Congress is not a large representative body of blacks? No, 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 I wouldn't say it's not a large representative of blacks. In fact, I was a member of it when it was operating. And it's the extended mission that you're referring to led by Mr. Tambo, in fact, which has campaigned for sanctions. Now, I don't say that what they say is not representative of, of black opinion. All I'm saying that in South Africa itself, Black people in their millions or, or hundreds of thousands have, have not supported sanctions because I have tested this. Uh, in, on the 1st of May this year, I had the largest rally that any leader, black or white, has ever had in South Africa, where I had 100,000 people in a rugby stadium in Devon, where with one voice they rejected sanctions. What about this man Bota, though, and the five million whites who hold the arms and the power? Do you think that they, they have will enough to improve the status of the blacks, including the Zulus in South Africa? No, I think that we still need more evidence for Mr. Porter. Mr. Porter has come out this year with what he calls a national council. He says this, this national council, Mr. Webster, is going to work on a new constitution for South Africa. Well, that is an objective is very sound and very noble. But I have said to Mr. Porter that the, one of the non-negotiables, if ever leaders with credibility can ever participate in this national council, is that he must unshackle black democracy. And by that I mean he must release Dr. Mandela, Mr. Mutuping, and other political prisoners, because I said that I don't, myself, as far as I'm concerned, there's no way in which I can cooperate with him as long as uh, Dr. Mandela and others are in jail. So you're not an official member of the Bota apartheid, not what, Bota structure? No, of course I'm you're not. In fact, I'm an opponent of apartheid. In fact, my passport, my first visit to this country was in 63 to attend the Anglican Congress in Toronto. And when I returned, the South African government took away my passport for nine years, for nine years. So, I mean, there are many other things that have happened to me as an opponent of, of, of apartheid. Uh, so I'm known, I'm received by heads of state in Africa, I'm received by heads of state in the West precisely because my credentials as an opponent of apartheid are impeccable. Is it possible to have a South Africa with five million whites, 20 million blacks, many of whom are violently opposed, Perhaps you and your people are not violently opposed. Is it possible to have a peaceful South Africa without first day bloodbath? Well, you know, um, you are in the First war, World War, uh, uh, Mr. Webb. Second World War. You, uh, second. You are in the Second, I'm so, I apologize. You are in the Second World War. And you know what fighting is. And you know that my people were forged in blood, in fact. We fought both the Africanas in 1838. We fought them also in... Uh, in, 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 in 1879, I mean the English now. We fought the English in 1879. And the last I'm struggling in South Africa was in 906, the Zulu Rebellion of 906. So we know what fighting means. I have said myself that I believe in a peaceful solution because there was the tradition of ANC before it was banned. I mean, it was a noble thing. Chief Albert Luthuli got a Nobel Peace Prize on the basis of this strategy, which I follow today. So it's not a, traitor, a treacherous strategy. But I have said, of course, that unless something happens, because there is a race against time in my country, unless some, something happens in South Africa quickly, it's clear that we may find that, you know, we're faced with a revolution. And I've said that if black people in their, you know, 
by and large, if black people want that to be the road that we should travel, that is the road of violence, any option of my people is my option. But I've just said that... What does that mean? Any option of your people is your option? Yes. You mean if your people wanted to be violent, you would... Then lead, I'll lead them. You then. will lead them in violence. Precisely. This is what I'm saying. But would that violence be against the whites or would it be against the ANC? Well, it would be against anybody who is denying my people human rights. I have no intention of fighting a war with ANC because really, even if we're alienated at present, I regard them as comrades in the struggle because I had a good relationship with Mr. Tambo and a very close one until 1980, in fact. And in 1984, Mr. Tambo wrote, to, sent a telex from Dar es Salaam from me because the, there was some problem in South Africa, this black on black uh, violence. And in fact, I wrote a long letter to him saying that I'm prepared to, re, uh, to meet him anywhere. And in fact, this year, the Secretary General of Inca, Dr. Oscar Lomo, mm -hmm. sent a telex to them saying so. I'm prepared even now to see Mr. Tambo anywhere. It's not, it's not myself who's not willing to see him. Uh, so things aren't too bad. No, because in fact, I think that Dr. Mandela's message you know, to me, in fact, sent to, which he conveyed to me through General Obasanjo, when the eminent persons group came to South Africa in, in March, was that you know, he was very concerned about this alienation between me and, Dr. and Mr. Tambo. And he said that if he was released, one of the first priorities that he would attend to would, would be to attend to this alienation between Why us. Why can't you get uh, Bota to release Mandela? If Mandela's well, as good and as reasonable a man as you seem to think he is. He is a very reasonable man. But I must say, in fairness to Porter, that you know, when I discussed the question of Mandela's release with Mr. Foster, he would just say, you know, with, with a, a deadpan face, that he, as long as he was prime minister, he would not release him under any circumstances. And therefore, uh, in fact, Porter has shifted a little, even if he's asking for a condition which cannot be met by Mandela if he says he must renounce violence. I don't, say that, I don't see if I was in his shoes how I could without being seen to be repudiating my brothers who are in Lusaga, you know, who are involved in the armed struggle. In Lusaga. More with Chief Butelezi after the break. I know that some callers will attack you, so let me attack you for a moment just in advance. Do you get your salary from the South African government? No. My salary comes from the KwaZulu budget. Zulus, of course, are taxpayers. And in fact, just like uh, there are federal funds that go to uh, some states here, I mean, funds are channeled for education and welfare of black people and for health. But in addition, in my budget, the Zulus themselves pay over 290 million rand. Right now. So my, my salary comes from that. Uh, were you sent on this trip, financed and paid for by the South African of, government? Of course not. It has nothing to do with them whatsoever. It has nothing to do with them. Well, what about the, forget, remember, I'm a North American, brainwashed by AP, UP, Reuters, and all the rest of it. What about living conditions? I see all these gruesome living conditions on the television, and Soweto, and shacks burning, and children being arrested and all schools being occupied no yes that is true i mean it's the, appalling the, isn't in, it in, it is appalling in the past few uh, years there's been a lot of um, security violence you know against blacks although it is abated a little uh, now i mean it is abated to the extent that more violence is between black and black but i mean conditions are appalling in my country because there's no free education for our children right. there's no compulsory education for our children and our people through the migratory labor system are separated from their families uh, so that people stay in the big cities away from their families for most of their lives, see their families only in, uh, in, at uh, Good Friday and also at Christmas time. And the housing, of course, is a very big problem. And you can understand, you know, Mr. Webster, that the black population in South Africa is increasing at the rate of 3% per annum, which is very high, which means, therefore, with 13 million blacks, that are only 15 years are younger, which is half the population of black, uh, black population of South Africa. The, po the population bulge creates enormous problems. Who is going to improve things? Uh, well, I think I that mean, Bota has not done much, has he? Well, I, I mean, lately, because of the uh, deteriorating economy, I mean, it, it has gone from bad to worse, shall I say so, because you'll find that around big cities like Durban, for instance, where I come from, there's something like 1.4 million squatters. These are people who just, you know, <coughs> s settle there, who haven't got anything, 
We have pieces of cardboards over their heads. We have nothing whatsoever. We're so, just there hoping to get a job. So therefore, sanctions by Canada and the United States and other Western countries, except Britain, are bad for living conditions for Africans. In, in fact, they worsen the conditions for them because uh, clearly you have less jobs you can create. You know, the, the more the economy is, 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 you know, suffers, then the less jobs you can create because you can only create jobs by, you know, creating more and more and more wealth. So you say that we should trade with South Africa, improve economic conditions, but we can't apparently force Bota to do better by the black population. I would say, sir, that most of your corporations, <coughs> I remember that Bata until recently was involved in South Africa, I would say that some corporations, for instance, American corporations who signed the Sullivan Code, in fact, did a lot to help black people to reach economic justice. Now, I, I think myself, I'm, I'm just wary of the fact that you are going to remove your only leverage if you, if you pull out as people are pulling out. And I believe that the economy of South Africa, it's often not realized in North America that it feeds many, many hundred, hundreds of thousands of people in the whole of Southern Africa. Because even the countries like Mozambique, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Botswana are employed in South Africa. Lesotho alone has got something like more 85 percent of their population employed in South so Africa. So therefore, when the sanctions close down economic opportunities in South Africa, conditions in the neighboring black states become worse. Precisely. That is why Mr. Porter, for instance, just before President Michel died, had given notice that he wanted all the Mozambicans out of South Africa. So you as Chief Otolazi are telling people who are watching this program, one, don't impose sanctions. Well, they've been imposed now, sir. Don't and impose any more sanctions. I would say that the message has been sent to Porter, you see. If Mr. Porter has any reason to, to understand the message, he can understand it now. Because I am sure the intention of the West is not to send the message written in the blood and suffering of black people. You sure? Well, I, I believe that when they suffer, then the message is sent in the suffering, is written in the suffering of Would of total people. sanctions not, for, not cause the collapse of the Bota government? Well, I'm not sure about that, sir, because I saw in Rhodesia that with a smaller economy that, in fact, the whole world cheated. Even Russia cheated on Chrome. Has human nature changed? I just don't trust the West that, in fact, they can, in fact, have a blockade which can en en ensure that they are total economic sanctions. Is, is the ANC, or, or many of the black organizations, are they backed by communism? Well, I, w I wouldn't say so, but the extended mission of ANC, of course, is uh, headed by Mr. Joss Lovo, who is a, Luther a Lutheran by birth, but a South African, who is in exile, who is also the chairman of the Communist Party. Uh, I would but admit communism is not, uh, you regard, as a menace in South Africa if the blacks were to take over. Well, I wouldn't say so. It depends who takes over and how he takes over. If you establish, you know, a one-party state by through the gun, then you, we may possibly have a Marxist state because that has happened in many countries in Southern Africa which have taken power through the Could it power. happen in South Africa? It's, it's quite possible. It could happen. Let's go to the phones. Go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, Jack. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Minister. Good, good evening. I applaud you for coming on to the program. Good evening, Jack. Good evening. Carry on. Good evening, Mr. Minister. Good, mo good evening, sir. I applaud you for coming on to Mr. Webster's program, mm -hmm. particularly in response to the gentleman that appeared two nights ago. Do you have a question? I, uh, the question, yes, that I would give him. Uh, I'm not concerned as a Canadian at the present moment that apartheid is so much of a question in South Africa at the moment. I think, myself, we've got a big green, a big red herring being pulled across the tracks by quite a colossal amount of communist money being poured into South Africa. Okay, let's try that. This man says that apartheid is not a major issue, but it's a red herring used by the communists. No, I think it's an international matter. It's an inter international issue. In fact, apartheid is the scourge on the face of the earth. And I think that, in fact, if it's not wiped off as soon as possible, even Mr. Porter has said it's, it's outdated. So I can't understand that there will be a Canadian who would defend it when Mr. Porter says so. And in October this year, the Dutch Reformed Church, which has always supported the government, you know, in its apartheid policies, has said that apartheid is a sin. You're telling me, therefore, that if South Africa were left to itself with the present outside pressure, that Botta would eventually bring around reasonable equality for blacks? Of course not. I mean, the threat of sanctions has had a role. The threat of violence by my brothers in the ANC has a role. The threat. But I mean, when you actually apply it, this way, there are problems. When it doesn't produce the results one expects to, to produce within the foreseeable future. Go ahead from Campbell River. Yes, uh, Chief, I would like to um, uh, pay credit to you as being a, a, a strong voice that's sort of right in the middle and uh, really, you're one hell of a sensible uh, leader, that's for sure. But uh, there's two things I'd like you to comment upon. 
Uh, what about uh, how are you trying to contain intertribal violence, which we've heard some reports of? And two, do you think that uh, possibly in the future, uh, after when the black government would take over, that you could give more preference to the South African black workers first instead of importing so many from uh, Bazidoran and Lesotho and Okay, and two Broadway. questions. First about intertribal violence. Is there much intertribal violence? Well, there have been incidents of that kind, but I think it's because, in fact, the government of South Africa abused ethnicity by fragmenting black people on the basis of ethnicity. So, in fact, there have been problems of inter-ethnic inter, inter uh, violence, and particularly on the mines where people were housed along ethnic lines, so that I couldn't pretend that incidents do not happen. But I, don't, I think it's exaggerated, really, when the government tries to use it as a rationale for separating black people. Mm -hmm. The other one was a job about preference, to, a question about preference for South Africans living in South Africa instead of bringing imported labor from around. Well, I think that, uh, of course, the wealth of South Africa has been produced by not only by black South Africans, but also by blacks from Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and other African states. So I think that it would be wrong myself because you'll find that in mining, for instance, that most of the people who are doing skilled jobs in the mines are people who come from Mozambique and Lesotho and other countries because they've been there for generations. More questions to Chief Botalezi after the break. Chief Butalezi from South Africa. Go ahead, please. Hello. I'd like to ask uh, Chief Butalezi, uh, who pays for the budget for operating KwaZulu? According to the South African Institute of Race Relations, 68% is paid by the South African government. That's the 1984-85 figures. And also, why is he allowed to have a paramilitary force when no other black organization can have it? Well, okay, two good questions. Let's take the second one first. Do you have a paramilitary force? It's a lot of, a lot of nonsense. That's Bangladesh. What military force? We've got a police in Gwazi, a police force, but we've no paramilitary force. I mean, that's now imbibing a lot of propaganda for my detractors. Your caller is and obviously a South African, are you not? Yes, I am. And another question was that 58% of your budget... 68 68. And that's according to the South African Institute of Race Relations. I mean, that is a stupid question because, in fact, Zulus are taxpayers. They've developed the wealth of South Africa. Now, if there is money that is made available for Zulu welfare, for education and so on, what nonsense is this? I mean, for instance, take uh, a place like uh, the United States and take, for instance, a city like uh, Los Angeles run by Tom Bradley. Tom Bradley is a Democrat and his money still comes for the running of the city from the federal state. He's not, by that, then a flunky of, of Reagan. And the same I can say for Atlanta, where my friend Andrew Young also is mayor. Now, it's a lot of nonsense, therefore, to say that if money from the fiscals of a country comes to, for the Zulu people, which is just a small proportion of what is due to us, then for people to try to make a song about that. And at the same time, I've said already that more than 200 million rand comes directly from Zulus from our own, we generate it ourselves. No, my point is that uh, he, uh, Mr. Uh, Butelezi seems to be in a very pri privileged uh, position. Uh, uh, if you compare his uh, uh, position with the, uh, his, uh, the KwaZulus with the rest of uh, the black South Africans. Okay, w well, how? How? Because you get money from the government to help run KwaZulu. But it's a lot of boulder dash. It's a lot of boulder dash. That oh, is nonsense. And, and okay, ma'am, thank you. Mm -hmm. She had a good crack at the whip. Go oh. ahead, please. Well, are you? That's you. Is it me? Yes. Okay, I have a question for uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Butlazi. Uh, he said he said he's against sanctions, and what I'm trying to find out is that uh, during the Polish crisis in 1980, all the Western powers imposed economic sanctions on Poland without anybody saying anything about hurting the Polish people. <coughs> now in South Africa. We hear people, including the Honorable Mr. Butlezi, saying that sanctions will hurt our people. Therefore, we shouldn't impose sanctions against South Africa. Does he care to comment on that, please? Yes, uh, I would comment by saying that as a Democrat, I have to respect what the people themselves feel. 
And I've, as, as I've explained during this program, the people themselves, the majority of the people, even if there are voices in South Africa which want sanctions, but the ordinary people in the streets are people I'm concerned with, and they have not called for sanctions. And when we compare the population of, Hol of, Pop of Poland with our population, it's not comparable, in fact, because you know that in South Africa, black people have had constraints caused by the restraint on their mobility, caused by past laws and influence control, so that in fact they couldn't even sell their labor where they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I mean the situation, the two situations are, are not comparable. But you do concede that the pressure from sanctions has caused Bota to be more reasonable. I, I've, I've said so. I've but you say so. that's enough. I say, I say that don't overplay your hand. I say the message has been sent to Bota. Go ahead from Victoria. Yes, good evening Jack, good evening Dr. Butelezi. Uh, my question Doctor, are you familiar with British Columbia Premier Bill Van Der Zam's earlier talk of selling BC built homes to South Africa? And if so, what's your view of such a plan? Well, sir, I would say that around Durban, there's something like 1.4 million blacks, not just Zulus, but who come from the Transkei and other places who live there, you know, without anything over their heads. So the question of housing is one of the things that concern me. You know, there's crossroads, and there are many crossroads in South Africa. So that the selling of housing of that kind is clearly something that would benefit blacks. Yeah, and, but and you wouldn't expect the, a province of Canada to break its federal policies and export uh, against the sanctions limitations. No, I'm dealing with the issue purely analytically. Yeah, if and the houses and were there, they could be useful. And academically, that's all, yes. Fair enough. Well, we'll leave that one at that. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hello. Yes. I'd like to know um, why this is all happening. And from what I gather, it has everything was fine until the white people moved in. Oh, ma'am, we can't go back into an absolutely hysterical anecdotage of the origin of the 300-year presence of the whites, whites uh, in South Africa, whites, uh, can no. we? No. That's kind of pointless, isn't it? No, they're not expatriates either. That's not the point there. No, they're South African. Yes, quite so. 300 years. They're yes, always going just, to be there. Just like Americans have been there for 300 years. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, Mr. Webster and Mr. Busalisi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Boothalisi, please. Yes, right. ma'am. Um, recently, I saw the leader of the African National Congress speaking on the Night Watch program from Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. At that time, he said that they would continue to escalate the violence until they got one man, one vote. And then the interviewer asked him what then. He said, in that case, when that happened, we will seize all the assets of the whites and kick them out of the country. Now, in that case, could any sensible government grant one vote, one man, one vote on such a premise? Well, I think that it's not possible either by whites or blacks to, to in fact, fight to the finish because, in fact, anyone who wins such a, a Holocaust, in fact, will, will, will end up with nothing but ashes. So I don't believe myself in, in scorching the earth because, you know, if you place, uh, uh, you know, South African whites against the wall, they'll scorch the earth. And I know that we as blacks can scorch the earth too. So the point is that neither whites nor blacks should scorch the earth because, in fact, uh, South African whites are not expatriates. In fact, they they belong to that country. And, in fact, they're Africans. If only they behave like Africans, we would regard them as Africans. You regard yourself as a moderate in the middle? No, I mean, that is just something you know, the media tries to put around my head. I, I, re, I reject the constitution of the country, sir, in part and in whole. And I don't want less for my people than anyone else. It's the propaganda of the media of saying that I'm in the middle. I have also said that causing in my veins is the blood of warriors. So that if my people's option is violence at any time, although I regard nonviolence as a noble cause, I've said that that option will be my option too. My thanks to Chief Butelezi from the Quazula homeland. Thank you, sir. And I'll be back after the break. <laughs> what did you do for me? Yes. Mm. I am a newsmonger. Here is a book called The Newsmongers. Here is a picture, the kind of picture that newsmongers are accused of using to twist the news. And I'd be the first person to say that when the Globe and Mail ran that during the Turner election campaign, I thought, boy, somebody in the Globe was out to fix them, to make them look bad and nasty. Now, here is Mary Ann Comber, who is a political scientist. 
and you're going to tell me how the media distort the political news in Canada. Where would you like to start? Well, we could start with that photograph. Uh, that was one of the largest photographs that the Globe and Mail has ever printed on their front page. And it was printed nine days before the 1984 federal election campaign. And do you think it did him any harm? I don't think it did him any good. Well, now, that's not nearly as damaging as the frequent pictures of another politician by the name of Joe Clark oh. fumbling the football. That was Robert Stanfield. Oh, that was Robert Stanfield. Well, yeah. Joe Clark seems to be the kind of guy who <laughs> that would, would fumble, would fumble well, the football. Be, yes. Do you suggest that the media... He, he lost uh, luggage instead. Uh, but do you suggest that the media deliberately picks a favorite and then distorts, say, the picture coverage according to their amour of the moment? You know, I think they, they build one leader up and they oversell him to, to Canadians and then they destroy him and they build someone else up. And we've seen that happen very recently. But is that the fault of the media as such? I think they get carried away. I think they get carried away with their own power. Now, I remember you mentioned, you mentioned Joe Clark a few minutes ago and he went on a trip around the world. Was it wrong for people like Fotheringham and others to point out that Joe's handlers kept losing everybody's underwear? <laughs> <laughs> now, what's yes, wrong with I doing that? It, I think it was wrong. The reason that those, those reporters were so angry about the, the lost luggage was that their luggage was lost too. We would never have heard about it if only Joe's luggage had been lost. Now, in the book, which I have skipped read, I haven't been all through it, have you taken any cognizance of the fact that Trudeau did not suffer nearly so much, did he? He had a very tempestuous relationship with the media, I think. But to begin with, nobody complained when he was depicted as a macho, youngish, 60-year-old mm -hmm. who could bounce about on a trampoline. Correct. Is that distorting the news? No, I don't, I don't really think it is because, in fact, from what I've ever seen, that is the way he was. You, it's an accurate portrait. So you reckon political porting, reporting can only be accused of distorting the news when it makes a guy look bad. No, no, no. Because I think they can make a guy look very good, too. Uh, especially if he has excellent handlers that control access to him, control his backdrop, and control the number of messages that he imparts in one, in one day. Who would, they, or which period of which leader would you suggest uh, showed up very well because of his handlers and his background and his backdrops. Well, I think Brian Mulroney did very well in the last federal election campaign and he was handled with kid gloves by the media through most of that campaign. And Ronald Reagan, uh, in his last election campaign, had very skilled managers that handled his presence everywhere. And uh, those managers have talked about their strategy subsequently. Well, uh, you, you pay a fairly sharp tax, particularly on CBC television news stories. Why? Well, we, we, we singled out the CBC National and the Globe and Mail National Edition as, as two aspects of the media that are available across this country and that enjoy a, a, a certain status. And we thought we would look at their coverage of the 1984 federal election campaign and really analyze it, and we did. And, and then we would take our conclusions and interview um, politicians and people inside and outside the media and uh, try to explore what their explanations for some of the things that we found were and whether uh, what we found in the election coverage carries over into political reporting in general. Uh, you, you use some specifics. For instance, you say, Turner's handlers are worried that he can't perform under pressure. Now, if that story was backed up with names and sources, surely there'd be nothing wrong with saying that. Don't you think every politician's handlers are concerned about how he's going to do in a press conference? Is that news? I don't think that's news. Well, it became news in the British Columbia election recently when one of the principal candidates kept suffering from incredible hyperventilation. Mm -hmm. And there were many stories pointing out that this guy was very upset indeed and a little bit anxiety knew. Uh, problems. Well, you know, Nothing that, wrong with that, is there? I come from Halifax, so I didn't get to hear very much about the BC election. And that is the only incident that I heard about, really. 
And it seemed to me that it was very understandable that a person could be intimidated by all these lights and the cameras. Not a political party leader. It shouldn't <laughs> be a political party leader if it's Why? going to be Is intimidating. Is that a qualification? I think it's an essential qualification for today's politicians. Well, it, it seems to be, but I think it's regrettable because I think a man's ideas are much more important than how he comes across in the media. Well, I don't have no personal knowledge of Mackenzie King, but they tell me that in an election nowadays he couldn't get 25 votes, far less a 110 seats, could he? Well, if he were sober, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I do think of him with John A. McDonald. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I yes, mentioned Mackenzie, Mackenzie King, King. was the one that talked to his mother, But the he? point you make here is that you say that the, these television news stories talked about Turner's handlers being worried he can't perform under pressure, mm -hmm. whereas in reference to Mulroney's decision to run in a Quebec riding, they called it noble but risky and incredible gut, incredibly gutsy. Mm -hmm. Now, supposing these were proper assessments, should a reporter not use these kind of interpretations? Well, I think first a reporter should report the facts. Mm -hmm. And I think that he should give some, some serious attention to making sure that he gets across the basic factual material in a news story. What the man said. Yeah, what the man said. In his own words as much as possible too, please, because we have to, we have to arrive at voting decisions based on what the man said himself. And what, what we get so much is reporters' interpretations of what the man said. In the, in the 84 election campaign, uh, there was, a, in our analysis, we found that um, uh, it was six hours of CBC national news coverage was focused on John Turner and Brian, Brian Mulroney. Right. Of that six hours, 42 minutes, or 12 percent of the total time, was that leader speaking directly, conveying his message directly. The, the other 88 percent was reporters assessing, giving their opinions. I, I think there's something wrong with that balance. I really yeah, do. I must say, I, get, I know at times when I watch national stories and the, the gov a government will bring in, uh, will do something. And the reporter will say, the government today decided that all cats in the future shall have six and a half legs. This means... <laughs> And then and they then go into what the they've SPCA been fed in the back room. And, yes, and we get all the But you must admit that the news coverage today with uh, these incredible scrums to which the politicians subject themselves, they're well, surely the author of much have? of... Well, they're the author of much of their own misfortunes, are they not? Well, it's, it's hard in the, in the halls of Parliament. By and large, therefore, when you're looking at how the media... And I found some of this book quite fascinating. Sorry you don't cover any West Coast stuff, mind you, which is an Eastern fault. <laughs> uh, I find there's Ottawa. a number of good lessons, but you expect too much. Well, I think that democracy is something that's very sacred. And I think that some of these reporters are really undermining our belief in, in the democratic process and our belief in, in our leaders. By not reporting fairly. Right. Well, best of luck with the newsmongers. And it's really fascinating, especially for people in the business how the media to start the political news. And this is my good friend now, Mary Ann Comber. And I'll be back after the break. Sure glad the IWAFIR dispute has, it would seem, on the face of it, to be settled. Uh, very academic on Monday. I'm going to have two university presidents here, Dr. Sewell from SFU, my alma mater, and Dr. Strangeways, Stangways, Dr. Stangways from UBC, 5 p.m. precisely. Stay tuned for the news hour.